All right. Good morning, everyone. Before I get started, here's what I'm going to do. Could I invite everybody who's in the back, please move up. We don't want to be the president to be talking or congressman to be talking to empty chairs, so please move up. <coughs> this is going to be a lively, engaging <coughs> discussion, and if we can get you all to move up, that will be very, very good. <laughs> Plus, if you're right here, I can see you if you want to ask a question. I can't see you if you're back there. So if that's not encouragement enough, So good morning again, everyone. My name is Mande Muyangwa, and I am the director of the Wilson Center's Africa program. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome His Excellency Olusegun Obasanjo, the former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to the Wilson Center. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome back to the Wilson Center for Congressman Frank Wolf, who's a good friend of the center and who has worked to support our institution. Uh, I would especially like to thank him for his leadership and efforts to elevate human rights issues to the top of the policy agenda here in the US as well as in the global policy making agenda. And I thank you for agreeing to participate in this uh, <coughs> discussion today. I would also like to take a moment to thank the International Committee on Nigeria, ICON, who have been central to making President Obasanjo's visit to the Wilson Center possible. Uh, quite frankly, this visit would not have, be, have happened without their support and their outreach to both Congressman Wolf and the Wilson Center. And I want to acknowledge Mr. Stefan Enada and Dr. Richard Ikebe, members of ICON's leadership who are present here with us today, as well as other members of their organization. Again, thank you so much for making this visit possible. I want to welcome everybody else in the audience, as well as those joining us via webcast and on Twitter. With us here today is a wide cross-section of the US government, members of the African and International Diplomatic Corps, a few Wilson Center board members, various stakeholders, interested citizens, and of course, many members of the Nigerian and African diaspora community. I thank you all for joining us here this morning. For those of you on Twitter, you can follow the live tweets of today's event at the Africa Program's Twitter account at Africa Up Close, and you can contribute to the discussion using the hashtag diversity in Nigeria, all one word. So bringing together scholarship and policy to address real world issues and challenges is at the heart of the mission of the Wilson Center. And today's discussion on managing di Nigeria's diversity amidst rising ethno-religious tensions speaks directly to our mission and therefore the reason why we are absolutely honored to be able to host both the Congressman and President Obasanjo this morning. Our discussion today is first and foremost critical to Nigeria as ordinary lives are lost and development and the overall nation building exercise in that country are negatively impacted. Nigeria has long struggled with the issue of ethno-religious tensions, as have a number of other African countries, uh, I might add. President Obasanjo will speak to us about what he sees to be the causes and the drivers of this ethno-religious tension and offer some suggestions about how Nigeria can better manage the ethnic and religious diversity to achieve a more inclusive society that benefits all. I, for one, have always believed that diversity is a strength Yet in far too many countries, we use it as a weapon to divide. And I'm really looking forward to hearing President Obasanjo's uh, remarks on this. So I know we have a lot of questions, so I want to jump in right away and introduce Congressman Wolf, who will provide some introductory remarks. And you can find his full bio in the handout. All I want to say for now 
is that he is the former member of the United States House of Representatives, where he represented Virginia's 10th congressional districts for 17 terms. He's a passionate advocate for human rights and religious freedom. He was appointed as the first ever Wilson Chair in Religious Freedom at Baylor University, and he is a distinguished senior fellow at the 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative. He is the author of the International Religious Freedom Act and is also the founder of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, a bipartisan group of members of Congress who raise awareness about international human rights issues. Congressman Wolf, welcome to the Wilson Center, and the mic is yours, sir. Thank you. I want to welcome His Excellency President Obasanjo, the first democratically elected president of Ni Nigeria. And I also want to thank uh, Jane Harmon, Congresswoman Harmon, and the Wilson Center for having this, this event. I believe that genocide is taking place in Nigeria. Boko Haram has killed over 27,000 civilians, and some say many more, more than ISIS killed in Iraq and Syria combined. According to the Global Terrorism Index, Nigeria is the third most dangerous country after Afghanistan and Iraq. Greg Stanton of Genocide Watch has said the following, quote, Boko Haram is committing genocide against Christians and crimes against humanity, against children, especially girls that kidnaps to become sex slaves. He said it forces boys to become child soldiers it massacres police and others associated with the Nigerian government. He said it commits war crimes against ordinary civilians who go to markets and other public places to which Boko Haram sends its suicide bombers, many of whom are children Boko Haram has kidnapped. Boko Haram, he said, claims to be a branch of ISIS. Mr. Stanton went on to say, quote, Fulani militants in central Nigeria are also committing crimes against humanity and genocidal massacres against Christians. He said what is mistakenly portrayed as a conflict between herders and farmers is actually a genocidal war, a genocidal war between ethnic groups that previously coexisted, united by Islamic extremists and modern weapons. The Islamic State of West Africa is operating in the Lake Chad region. In a recent report, the highly respected Jamestown Foundation said the following. They said, one thing for sure, the fractional dynamics in jihadism in Nigeria and the Lake Chad region will continue to shift. They went on to say, while the violence expands, deepens, and perhaps becomes more intractable, end of quote. In April of 2014, Boko Haram garnered worldwide attention for kidnapping 276 Christian schoolgirls. The world responded with a hashtag, Bring Back Our Girls Twitter campaign. Five years later, five years later, more than 100 of the girls are still missing and are all forgotten. When I was in Nigeria, I talked to one of the moms and they said when they heard the hashtag, Bring Back Our Girls, they were so excited that something was going to happen. And I checked. Uh, this past April, five years, no one, no one did hashtag bring back our girls. In a more recent event, a young girl named Leah Sherabu was among a group of girls kidnapped by Boko Haram two years ago. Boko Haram released all the girls who professed to embrace Islam. Leah, at that time, age 14, was the only one to refuse. And as a result, she is being held by Boko Haram as a slave for life. Keep in mind that four American soldiers were killed in Niger, and the region could become, according to the experts, could become a breeding ground and a staging area for attacks against the West for terrorists and a possible resurgence of ISIS into Iraq. America, America should always speak out and take action against genocide against crimes against humanity. We must not forget history when the world and the United States ignored, ignored the genocide in Rwanda. Hundreds of thousands of people died. I can still remember the cables were coming into the State Department 
cables were coming into the UN and the world ignored what was taking place. Many experts believe that Nigeria could implode, which would destabilize the surrounding countries and send millions of refugees into Europe and beyond. Nigeria, with a population of over 195 million, is the largest country in Africa. And there are 350,000 to 400,000 Nigerian Americans who were concerned over the fate of their relatives. And it is said, so goes Nigeria, so goes all of Africa. It is clear that the crisis plaguing Nigeria is multifaceted, but one that must be addressed by the Nigerian government and the U.S. government and the international community. Because this is a problem that affects the countries surrounding Nigeria as well. I believe that we need a special envoy for Nigeria and the Lake Chad region who can coordinate the response to the crisis by various agencies of our government and who can work with the allies in France and England and other countries on terrorism, hunger, sexual trafficking, corruption, religious freedom, human rights violations, education, all of the different aspects. One of the models would be, if you recall, when President Bush appointed Senator John Danforth as a special envoy for Sudan, it was done in the Rose Garden with President Bush on one side of Senator Danforth and Secretary Colin Powell on the other side. I think we need now, based on what is taking place, to do the same thing with regard to Nigeria and the Lake Chad region. The challenges that face Nigeria and the Lake Chad region are great. However, it is my firm belief that the United States and other Western nations have a vested interest in confronting one of the worst crises of our day. Nigeria has been fractured and forgotten. Let us not forget it anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Wolf, uh, for that impassioned um, analysis of what's going on in, the, in Nigeria and why it matters to the United States. Uh, we appreciate the recommendation that you, you have made, and hopefully between your recommendations and President Obasanjo's recommendations, we will be able to offer some practical way forwards for addressing this very, very challenging uh, problem. So thank you once again. Um, it is now my hard job to introduce a man who needs no introduction. Um, but what I want to do is just pinpoint a few key things about his life's journey, which will give us a backdrop to his accomplishments, but also a sense of why he thinks the way he thinks on some of these issues that we're going to hear about uh, today. So as many of you know, President Obasanjo started his career in Nigeria's military and rose through the ranks, attaining the rank of Lieutenant General in 1976. He took over as Nigeria's military leader following the assassination of General Mutala Muhammad in 1976. President Obasanjo is widely credited for returning democracy to Nigeria. Instead of continuing, with the military rule that had characterized the country to that point. He instead presided over elections, which were won by Shehu Shagari, Nigeria's first democratically elected civilian president, after more than 13 years of military rule. He was a staunch critic of the military when it resorted to yet more coups to remove uh, civilian uh, presidents. He later served as Nigeria's president from 1999 to 2007 under Nigeria's Fourth Republic, thus again marking Nigeria's return to democratic civilian rule. Since leaving office, he has been an active elder statesman, representing Nigeria and the continent in various capacities. He has played an important role in strengthening the African Union. He helped to establish the new Partnership for Africa's uh, Development and the African peer review process. He also served on the leadership of the TANA Forum a Pan-African forum established 
to really push the dialogue and the solutions to some of Africa's pressing security challenges. And it was my honor to work with him and to get to know him a little bit better uh, while he was at the TANA uh, Forum. He has also advocated for a strengthened West African regional cooperation through ECOWAS and the Co-Prosperity Alliance Zone. He has served as chairman of the Group of 77, the Commonwealth Heads of Government Meeting, and the NEPED Heads of State and Government Implementation Committee. He has also served as an international mediator for several conflicts in Africa, including serving as a UN Special Envoy to the Great Lakes region. Please join me in welcoming President Obasanjo to the Wilson Center. So, Baba, the mic is yours. Do your thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, let me start by saying good morning to you, brothers and sisters and friends. And um, let me also give my appreciation and thanks to uh, Jen Hanna, who is, of course, on avoidably not here, but uh, made all the preparation to make this uh, meeting possible. And Monday, thank you very much for uh, your introductory remark. Uh, Congressman Wolf, thank you very much for what you are doing and um, for our part of the world generally, but for Nigeria in particular. And um, uh, I cannot agree with you more on the uh, point you have made that this country needs to have a special envoy to look at things and hold things together. And you mentioned a number of them, security, um, population, education, development, uh, particularly in the northeast uh, zone of Nigeria and in the Lake Chad region. Maybe later on as we go along, we will talk more about that. Um, I want to thank the uh, International Committee on Nigeria uh, with Stephen and Richard uh, for making it possible for me to be here. Because as Mundi uh, said, um, if not for the pressure put on me by uh, Richard, uh, he knows that I would not have been here. And, um, but uh, I like the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I have chosen to talk about uh, diversity, management of diversity uh, in Africa generally, but in Nigeria in particular, because it is very relevant, especially when we talk about all the things happening in Nigeria, the Nigerian situation, what could be the core or the center piece, if you like, of uh, the problems that we have. And um, when people ask me, what are your worst fears about Africa? I, do never, I never hesitate to mention two issues, management or mismanagement of diversity and management or mismanagement of population, particularly the youth bulge. The third one, that is rearing its ugly head is credibility of elections and the effect of that on democracy and governance. Our emphasis today at this meeting is management of diversity, which has implications for the other two issues I've mentioned. I mean, if we are able to manage diversity successfully, 
through good governance and good leadership, we will be, uh, we will by extension, manage pop population well, and electoral process is also likely to be well managed to give free, fair, credible, and generally acceptable election results. Diversity by itself is no problem. God is God of diversity and variety. Diversity is natural. It should be respected. It should be extolled. It should be celebrated. And it should be well managed. Diversity is beauty and it should be cherished. It must not be destroyed by acts of omission or commission. Sameness is unnatural. It is man-made. It is monotonous, unbeautiful, boring, and not what the world or community should be. The nearness uh, the nearest uh, sameness created by God, as far as human beings are concerned, is identical twins. They have different fingerprints to prove and establish their differences and diversity. The problem is poor management or mismanagement of diversity due to ignorance, lack of knowledge and understanding, incompetence, bad governance, and very poor leadership. Let me expatiate on this. Some people are ignorant about the components or constituents of their nation. What we are ignorant of, you can neither appreciate nor handle well. Knowledge and understanding of diversity within a nation is is utmost is of utmost importance. Incompetence, bad governance, and poor leadership lead to poor appreciation or non-appreciation at all of the importance of diversity. The breeding and upbringing of a leader also affect his attitude to diversity, his management and protection and sustenance of diversity. The problem, therefore, is not diversity per se. The problem is with those who have to manage diversity. And in managing it badly, dispute, agitation, disunity, division, conflict, violence, segregation, separation, and even secession rear their ugly heads. We have seen it in Ethiopia and Eritrea. We have seen it in Sudan and South Sudan. And no country in Africa is immune from it not even Somalia, that is homogeneously, ethnically, and religiously, uh, that is homogeneous, ethnically, and religiously, but divided into clans. We must remind ourselves that all the three regions of Nigeria at independence, north, east, and west, have either planned or attempted secession without success so far. The attitude of leaders is most determinant. Some leaders show hatred, bigotry, phobia, favoritism, nepotism, intolerance, lack of democracy, lack of accommodation, no room for genuine dialogue, and they show personal insecurity. With all of these, or any of them, a leader cannot manage diversity successfully. 
And without successful management of diversity, we are doomed. What is the way forward? Leadership must be educated, knowledgeable, understanding, competent, and nationalistic. <coughs> Governance must be democratic, making strenuous effort in nation building, particularly democ uh, democracy, politically, economically, and socially. Participatory democracy, politically, economically, and socially. Society must be made inclusive, justice, <coughs> fairness, equity, and equality of opportunity must be the order of the day. Leaders must be receptive and they must shun impunity. People must be made to feel belonging and having a stake in the nation. It must be a country for all and my country for every individual. Nobody should have a feeling or sense of exclusion or marginalization. If such a feeling exists, it must be addressed. The attention must be paid to the whole and not to a part or the sum of parts. There must be a common vision to complement legal or constitutional institution. It must include common dream, common stake, common national purpose, and common motivation. The nation must be able to offer security within and without to all its citizens. Where leadership and governance fail to ensure provision of, ed of education, security, employment, reasonable and satisfactory living condition for all its citizens, management of diversity is impaired. There should be no polarizing and destructive identity narratives. What is the Nigerian situation? If any country is diverse, Nigeria is one of such country. It is the diversity that makes us what we are. With a population of some 210 million people, according to the UN, we are the largest country in Africa and the largest population of black people in the world. But population without all that should go with it in terms of development, unity, cooperation, security, enhanced living standard in just, uh, in just fair and equitable and shared and inclusive society with all the democratic and human rights and choice will amount to nothing. We must not forget our past and our t uh, history to continually put us side by side of our contemporary nations at independence to learn the right lessons of how and why we have slid back. So, when we put Nigeria on the scale of diversity management, leading to wholesome society that every Nigeria envisages, how does it weigh? How do we stand? Most of you here know as much as I do that the answer is not much. Here we do not have to go over the history of Nigeria, except to say, like most other countries, we are an artificial creation. We must admit that not making Nigeria a great nation after independence must not be, uh, must be our responsibility and nobody else's. Since independence, Nigeria has not been as divided as it is today, not even during the Civil War. 
And what is wrong? It can be put in one sentence. It is essentially the mismanagement of diversity, springing from bad governance. All the points made earlier as to the problem of management of diversity generally are all present in Nigeria today. The other two issues of world fairs that I mentioned, youth bulge and free, fair and credible elections are all there. To all these must also be added the new reign of fear and intimidation leading to cooptation of all institutions and their inability to function freely and unfettered. Compounding the situation. And where do we go from here? All the prescriptions made earlier in the way forward must apply to Nigeria, failing which our ship is heading to Iraq. Let me emphasize dialogue and taking with ourselves seriously and, and talking with ourselves seriously, dignifyingly and as equals and not as master slaves, but as citizens of the same country on equal and mutually beneficial basis. There's no group, tribe, section or region in Nigeria that is innocent. It should not be blame game, but accommodating an understanding game of brotherhood, friendship, cooperation, sharing and caring, and good neighborliness. Let me reiterate here. I am an incurable optimist, and I believe that at all cost, Nigeria is worth saving. It is worth being held together in unity, solidarity, common security, shared prosperity, and inclusive democratic and progressive society. Then the question now is who will save Nigeria? Make it secure with well-managed diversity, fast-growing economy, wholesome social order, satisfactory development, and improved living standard for all citizens? The answer to me is simple and straightforward. It's the Nigerians. And here, I want to commend the Nigerians at home and in diaspora who have stoutly and courageously stood out to be counted to, prop to propagate change of our depressing situation. If you fold your hands, standing aloof and wringing your hands when oppression and evil are being perpetrated, you are an accomplice to the evil. If, Nigeria don't, if Nigerians don't take responsibility for their own future and their own fortune at whatever, at whatever cost, then little should we ask our friends to carry the burden of our togetherness and progress on our behalf. What you are doing here today, in part, of making contribution, it's part of making contribution for the desirable change. Again, I ask, who will save Nigeria? Already, some Nigerians are at work, but we need to work more, work together, and pray harder. Prayer alone is not enough. Let us work as if it depends on us and top up with prayer for God's blessing. We should then appeal to friends of Nigeria and our development partners, and of course here and in other parts of the world, 
there are many of them. Again, I want to thank the like of Cons Congressman uh, Wolf and others who have always stood with Nigeria and who continue to stand with Nigeria. <coughs> and who wish Nigeria well. And we ask them to continue to supplement and complement the efforts of Nigeria at home and in diaspora with diplomatic and economic sanctions against Nigerian individuals and corporate bodies, institutions, and families who are participants, perpetrators, and active contributors to the mismanagement of our diversity, bad management of demography, and mismanagement of electoral process in Nigeria, all of which are slowly but surely destroying our democracy and our nation. If we Nigerians lead in making good use of our diversity by managing it well, our friends and partners will give appropriate helping hand. It will all go well for Nigeria, for Africa, and indeed for the world. As we have heard, the world needs Nigeria just as much as Nigeria needs the world. We covet the support of friends and well-wishers. A Nigeria with well-managed diversity, robust security, conducive environment and conditions for investment, good leadership and good governance, playing its rightful role in Africa and the world, we, lead, uh, we need heavy investment which can be generated from within and from outside Nigeria. And it can be done. I always say the money is there, out there, but it's also cowardly because once anything happens, that money goes out faster than it comes in. Let me end on the note of restructuring which has become a boss word in Nigeria today. Anything that will strengthen our unity, hasten our development, and ensure our security and progress must be sought, discussed, and embraced. And if restructuring will ensure these objectives, I am all for it. But we need to know in detail what restructuring means, what it entails, what it will accommodate, and where it will reasonably lead us as a country eager to be among the leading nations of the world. That is, I believe, what we need to do in management of our diversity and in making sure we have good governance. Thank you, brothers and sisters and friends for listening. President Obasanjo, thank you so much um, for those remarks. Now, you have known me long enough, I think about seven years now, to where I'm going to be direct. I really appreciate your remarks. I think three immediate thoughts come to my mind, and I don't want to get in the way of my Nigerian brothers and sisters who are waiting to engage with the president. The first thought for me is, as I was listening to you, was you need to be giving this presentation at the African Union. <laughs> the people who need to hear those words, your words, are not sitting in this room. Some of them are, but the people who are responsible for the issues that you're talking about is really a discussion that needs to be grappled with head on with the key people who actually make the policy recommendations and lead their countries to take this issue on directly. So I think that was point n number one. I really appreciate your sharing as you did because you were actually uh, spot on in terms of the management of diversity. 
the second issue that came to mind, you were talking about what causes the mismanagement. I agree with you, but I was also thinking that one of the issues we have on the continent, not just in, in Nigeria, in some countries I might add, I think some countries are doing better than others, is that the short-term political gain derived from mismanaging diversity has to be grappled with long as well. Because I think that short-term political gain overshadows the long-term implications and consequences, especially when you tie it into the fact that in some countries you're not able to hold those leaders accountable through the ballot box. So I think that would be uh, a, a second uh, part of it uh, for me, that we need to figure out how we tie in the issues that you are talking about, about holding people accountable, because we cannot continue on this path. So those were just my initial thoughts. I have many more, but I recognize that there are many people in the audience who would like to engage with you and Congressman Wolf on the remarks that you have just given. So what I'm gonna do now is I will open up the floor for question and answer and comment. So if you'd like to uh, pose a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. I will acknowledge you. We will take three questions at a time. When you get the mic, please identify yourself and the institution, your institutional affiliation, if any, and uh, let us know if you're directing the question to Congressman Wolf or uh, to President Obasanjo. I see a lot of hands already. Monday, so what I'm going to do... If you do not, uh, if I may ask you for a uh, crave your indulgence, mm -hmm. let me make a remark a little bit on the two points you have raised. All right. So that um, we do not cover that with In the other question. questions. All right, sir, please. Uh, those who need to hear my remark and in the AU, they probably have heard me over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, as you said in your introductory remark, I was one of those who brought about the new organization, AU, mm -hmm. which uh, was the transformation of OAU, and then NEPAD and APR. And all these were embedded in NEPAD and APRM. NEPAD was a, uh, it's a program of AU, and I ran that for almost seven years. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what I have, in fact, you could say that I'm, a, I'm, I'm talking like a broken record. Mm -hmm. What I've been saying, I've been saying since the beginning of AU to those who are my colleagues, those who I have left before I left, and those who are there when I left. So that issue, but the point is that I think all Africans yes. need to know this, because they too can, in their own different ways, put pressure to bear on their leaders to do what is right. The second point you have made is um, uh, short-term political gain. Well, I, I think that is a problem that is there for all political leaders, mm -hmm. uh, all political leaders, not one. But that is what makes the difference between good leadership and bad, and bad leadership, good governance and poor governance. Now, how far forward can you look now, are you only looking at the next election and no longer looking at the, even the current generation, not to talk of the next generation? Mm -hmm. And the problem, and that is the point that I have been trying to make, is that we must be looking beyond the next election. If all that we are looking at is the next election, then we will be a failed leaders. That's the point I've made. Sure. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate your taking the time to, uh, to, to answer those two uh, questions. 
So let me open it up again. Again, I'll take three questions at a time. Identify yourself, your institutional affiliation, if any. And uh, what I'm going to do, because there's so many hands, is one minute. We don't want to hear the history of Nigeria. Most of us are here because we understand it. Uh, but please get to your point. Ask your question so we can get as many people in as possible. So let me start right here, and I'll work my way there. Right here, right there, and then right over here with the lady, and then I'll take the next round after that. Your Excellency, my name is Emmanuel Ogebe with the U.S. Nigeria Law Group. And as ADF country representative, you welcomed me to uh, Abuja, and I'm now welcoming you to Washington. Now, uh, when you were president, the Sharia crisis broke out, and uh, Boko Haram also broke out. Our research indicates that um, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan pushed foreign fighters from uh, Afghanistan into Nigeria, and that that intelligence was shared with your government. Can you inform us on Now, that? say that again. When the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, they found Nigerian foreign fighters alongside bin Laden. And U.S. sources claim that the Nigerian government was informed that Nigerians were fighting with the Taliban. I want to know if you were aware of this intelligence at the time. Secondly, I want to uh, commend you for going to negotiate with Boko Haram even as a retired general. Uh, that shows your respect for diversity. Can you let us know why those negotiations failed? And finally, I thank you for uh -uh, putting uh -uh. Uh, hey, my a, brother. a church in the presidential villa. That was very good of you. No, thank seriously, you. please limit yourself to one question. Maybe I should have been, I, I should have been clear <laughs> so we can get in as many people as, possi as, many people as, as possible. Let me uh, get the gentleman that was next. I think it's a gentleman back there. Sorry. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ifeolo Amaya Wakimadi. Ekarosa, um, my question is basically about, in general, Nigeria's population, like you said, an artificial creation of European colonialism, which of 200 million. I won't go into the issue like you mentioned. However, my question is, in general, should Nigeria exist as one entity? Because if you look at the last election, there's a clear divide between the North and the South. There's a clear divide between et ethnicity and religious principle and different cultural ethnicities. Not that division will solve the problem, however, Nigeria is like you talk about responsibility or Nigerians taking responsibility in the future and moving ahead. Shouldn't leaders consider Nigeria as one entity in the sense that should we really exist as one country or should we possibly divide it up to ensure that we're in mismanagement is less likely to happen? Thank you. Okay, and then there was a lady right here. I think the mic is coming from the other way. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, good morning everyone. My name is Amaka Anku. I run the Africa practice at, at Eurasia Group, which is a global polyclorist consultancy. My question is, um, you spoke in pretty broad terms about what you perceive as current mismanagement of diversity in Nigeria. I'd like to hear specifically exactly what you feel is being done that you would have done differently. How exactly is m diversity being mismanaged currently? And how would you address the criticisms out there that in fact your opposition is more is, is due to the fact that a lot of elites have now been locked out of patronage systems under the present government? Thank you. Well, so <coughs> thank you very much. I, I think the first question, whether the um, uh, American government sent uh, Nigerian or report about Nigerian found fighting in Af Afghanistan. That never came to me. But I do not say that Nigerians are not found, found, uh, found fighting in Af Afghanistan or, or anywhere. In fact, um, <laughs> we know that Nigerians were, uh, uh, Gaddafi recruited many Nigerians, not only Nigerians, Kenyans, N Nigerians, uh, Burkina Faso people. Uh, but that was not sent to me. Um, then uh, you ask about how did I manage? What is the second point you asked? How did I manage? Your dialogue with Boko Haram. Okay, in my dialogue with Boko Haram. Um, <clears throat> uh, le let me take t a little bit of time to explain that. Um, I think Boko Haram, Sharia was there when I was there. Uh, it was started by Yerima 
in Samfara. And um, anybody who is sensible and sensitive about Nigerian situation will know that one thing that can be irrationally difficult to handle is religion in Nigeria. And I know the reason why Yerima went the way he went. And um, he went to Sharia to save his neck and to protect himself. And, um, I, and it is in this country, when I was asked, I said, look, I understand Sharia. If it's a religious Sharia, it will survive. If it is not, it will fizzle out. And it did fizzle out. And um, later on, I saw Yerima. And Yerima, I said, Yerima, he caught one hand, and he never caught his second hand. And I said, Yerima, are there no thieves in your state anymore? You have caught only one hand, you didn't caught. He said, sir, that one hand was a mistake. I won't caught another one. He didn't caught another one. He made, uh, I, I think it's only in Katsina, they had uh, somebody who was a lady who was supposed to have been caught in adultery and it was supposed to be stoned to death. Then uh, I called the governor. I said, how are you going to handle this? Say, leave it to me. I left it to him. And then, of course, the Sharia court uh, gave uh, judgment that the lady should be sentenced to death by stoning. And then I was furious. I called the governor. I said, look, you asked me to leave it to you. I have left it to you. This is not acceptable. He said, OK, leave it to me. <laughs> and, uh, I said, this time I will leave it to you, but I will be following you as you are handling it. And then, of course, he asked his attorney general to appeal, and they appealed, and then, of course, nobody was stoned to death. Now, the point is this. How do I handle this? The point is that in a country like Nigeria, what Yerima wanted me to do is to roll out the tank and say, Sharia, no. And, of course, if I got... Uh, a petition on anything for my eight years in, in, uh, as a democratically elected president on any subject, it is on Sharia. And um, if I had done what people wanted me to do, maybe Nigeria would not be what it is today. But it's just a question of, again, knowing what you need to know and doing what you need to do. What matters is that we survive and Sharia I think 12 states in Nigeria made Sharia law. The Sharia laws are there, but nobody hears about any Sharia today. If I have rolled out the tank, it will have been a different story. Um, North-South, I think North-South is a question of management. I, uh, and there's no homogeneous North or homogeneous South that we we'll talk about. Now, if you talk about north today, where do you put Plateau? Where do you put uh, Benue? Um, even when you take uh, states like Adamawa, um, they are divided. Even Bonu, that's where you get uh, Chibok girls, 276 of them. They were all, almost all, uh, 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 Christians. Um, so I, I don't, and when you look at our, the profile of our uh, census, it does not really match what some people are preaching. The 2006 uh, census, which is not being used, figure, um, shows that the North, as you have it today, 19 states, is about 527 close to 53% of the population, and the South, with 17 states, is about 47% uh, uh, percent of the population. So um, even the South is not homogeneous. Um, there are substantial uh, Muslim population uh, and animists, uh, just as you have in some parts of the North. Now. <clears throat> 
So that uh, is not an issue. Uh, the election, if you put election on basis of North-South, I think um, apart from uh, of, uh, manipulating the election result, I don't think you will get it, the result that you want. In 1999, the Yorubas didn't vote for me. They are from the South. I'm a Yoruba man, and they didn't vote for me. But the rest of the country voted for me, and I got almost two-thirds uh, two of the vote cast. Um, the third question, uh, I was trying to write it, but I didn't. It, it was so, about um, managing diversity that you talked in very general terms. Okay, yeah, I talked in very general terms. Now, and what should I have done that term? Um, uh, le let me give you two or three examples. Um, I just mentioned now, in 1999, the election, the Yorubas, who will probably, it depends on how you look at it, um, they will be either the second largest tribe in Nigeria, or depending how, if you take Hausa Fulani, you separate them, Hausa separate and Fulani separate, the Yorubas might even be the largest uh, uh, tribe in Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> they didn't vote for me. And immediately after I took over government, I called some members of my government. I said, look, the Yorubas didn't vote for us. Let us see what we can do. I didn't say that because they didn't vote for me. The type of statement that President Buhari made when after the 19, uh, 20, 2015 election, and he said only those who voted for him will enjoy patronage. Now, that immediately put the back of some people up. Now, and then there are at least two zones who did not vote for him. South, South did not vote for him. South East did not vote for him. And anything he does, they see it, oh, he has said those who did not vote for him will not enjoy patronage. So you divide them. You, it, you made it they and we uh, straight away. I wouldn't do that. That is specific. Then <clears throat> when you have a situation where your own tribe is being accused of something, now you must be able to look into it and make it transparently clear that that accusation is unfounded, or if it's founded, you deal with it. The, there have been, well, herdsmen, uh, 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 farmers. Now, herdsmen are mainly Fulanis. Nothing has been done. Rather than doing something about it, what we are having is, OK, we will create colonies, cattle colony. Where will you create colony in Nigeria? Is it in my own part of the country that you will now make a colony? Who will give you land to create colony within its own uh, state? So these are specific. You are asking for specific. I can go on and on. But there are many things that should not have been done that have been done, and many things that should have been done that are not been done that will have helped in the area of management of diversity. Thank you, President Obasanjo. Now, we have uh, Congressman Wolf here. So what I want to do is, because this is also a, it's, it's, it's a global issue, as we, we talked about earlier on. So I want to internationalize two of the comments that were made. One is, there was a question here about um, intelligence sharing. Uh, after all, terrorism is a global problem. Uh, we see these uh, people going back and forth with no respect to international borders or regions. And so the question was, um, what did the Nigerian leadership know uh, after the um, Af Afghanistan and the Taliban? And so my question to you would be, would you care to comment if this is something that's up your, your alley in terms of how the international mechanism for sharing uh, information, uh, the US and other countries on this problem has evolved since President Obasanjo was in office. Obviously, you can't deal with the problem unless you're getting the, uh, the information that you need to deal with it. 
And then the second comment that was made was about negotiating with Boko Haram. Now, I know this is a lively debate about whether or not uh, one should negotiate with terrorists. I mean, from a U.S. perspective, uh, what, what is the viewpoint then? What is the rationale for it? And how would it feed into, uh, say, African countries negotiating with some of their terrorist groups? Well, one, I, I think all of the nations, the Western nations, have a vested interest in what's taking place. You now have in Italy, you have 15,000 uh, Nigerian girls and women being sexually trafficked in, in, in southern Italy. You have, yeah. every time there's a boat sinking in the Mediterranean, uh, 5 to 10 to 15 percent of the people are, are from Nigeria and, and the surrounding region. We have reports, if you look at the Jamestown Foundation, of people leaving the Middle East uh, coming into the region. You have the, the killing of four American soldiers. I think there has to be a greater involvement of the United States to coordinate, but also with the French. The French have a vested interest there. Uh, the English have a vested interest there, and many of the other countries do. Uh, I saw a, a statement by uh, the Irish singer Bono about two years ago. He said, it is an existential threat to Europe if this area fragments. So I think there needs to be sharing. On the issue of uh, uh, negotiating with Boko Haram, I think that really should be left to the, to the Nigerians. I don't think it's appropriate uh, for me to make a comment whether they should be negotiating. I don't think the United States is coming in to run. I think uh, what you had, if you recall, on Senator Danforth, Senator Danforth coordinated all of the aspects of our government and brought them in working with both, if you recall, uh, Salva Kiir at that, that time and also uh, with the North to sort of bring the thing together. So I think whether you negotiate, that's up to that. But I think the Americans have an opportunity to come around and enable the Nigerian government to do things that it currently has a very difficult time doing now. Thank you. Let me take another round of uh, three questions. Priya, where are you? All right. Did he leave? All right. Uh, let me go over the back. I'll start with the gentleman over there, come to the lady over here, and then go right in the corner over there, and then I'll, I'll bring it up. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Doug Burton. I'm, I, I'm a writer for Zenger News, as well as some local newspapers. Uh, I'd like to ask your response to the citizens' movements that have been arising in the last four years. Uh, you said that the problem is mismanagement of mismanagement of diversity, uh, but what we've seen in the last four years it, with the Brexit effort, with the rise of parties in Europe such as the uh, AFD in Germany, uh, the Sweden Democrats with the Liga North in Italy, are populist movements which assert citizens' rights and resist multi-national uh, organizations such as the EU or 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 the United Nations. And in the United States, we witnessed the, the rise of a, a popular president who, who is said to be a nationalist. Do you see a, uh, a parallel between what is happening in Nigeria in terms of nationalism, or should there be a, a parallel uh, between what is happening in Nigeria and what's happening in Europe and the United States? Okay, that's one question. The lady right there. Good morning, sir. My name is Olwa Fonkare Bayo. Um, and I'm representing two particular groups, I guess. My mother is the president of the Idonre Progressive Association, which is an organization that helps a subset of the Yoruba people, particularly from Ondo State. And myself, my name is, like I said, Olaf Fungadebayo, and I work at the Department of Energy with the Energy Information Association. So my question is kind of two-pronged, and it's about diversity. My first question is, how can diasporans help effectively? As you mentioned, the solution to Nigeria is from Nigerians. Um, I went to Penn State, studied energy engineering to help Nigeria with the energy sector. I have land there. I've tried as, as much as I can possibly to break into the Lakers public work sector, and I have not been able to get my hands on ground to help, even for free. No one is trying to, you know, kind of work with me there. And the Edora Progressives Association as well, excuse me, I'm stuttering. Um, has also tried to help Edorian as much as they can, but it's very hard working with the government on ground. And my second question is, do you feel it will be, it will be helpful if diasporans vote? Because like you said, um, we are not on ground, and we are not, I guess, influenced by the politics that, that's happening there in the country. So if we're able to actually vote and, and help choose who our government leaders are, can we affect change? Thank you. Thank you. And there was a gen the gentleman at the back over there. 
Can somebody get him a mic, please? And then I'll work my way up. So I'm coming. I see you. Yeah, hello, Mr. Obasanjo. All right, my name is Enoch Entry. Uh, I'm part of North Rock, and we're a tech company. So my question is regarding the regional integration. Uh, I remember you when you were in power, you were one of the few African pre uh, presidents in the ECOWAS community that was trying to um, push for the regional integration of the ECHO. And my question to you is, uh, with the concept of free trade agreement that's currently happening right now, along with um, the, the regional bias towards integration, However, it seems like there's also a divide in, uh, in the ECOWAS community between the Francophone uh, and the Anglophone communities. What are some steps that are being done now to uh, really, really aggressively um, uh, tackle this issue? Because, I mean, there's, there's no way we can sit up and talk about Africa pros prosperity without really, really solving the root of this problem. And um, to you, Congressman, where does United States stand when it comes to um, uh, the whole? Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the when it comes to France's position, I know that uh, Italy's Prime Minister called uh, France out and mentioned that hey, we have a we have a we have a migration crisis happening, you know, all pa partially because of uh, $500 billion being smuggled out by French companies every year. You know, if things were better on the ground, th that would not be the way. Um, uh, where does the United States stand, and what is the United States doing to help um, uh, solve and facilitate this issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> let, let me take the first point about uh, nationalism. I don't believe that uh, Nigerians in or out, going out or coming in, are driven by nationalism in the sense that we see populism and what I will, with all due respect, call misdirected nationalism coming out in the West. Um, one thing that has served the world very well is liberal democracy since the beginning of the last century, at least since the end of the First World War. And it has made, and it has helped the development of the world. Then, much later, you have globalization. Now, for all that to be set aside and say now you are going to look inward, I believe is myopic. And I, we cannot even afford it. We are going the, the other way. We have just last year signed um, Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Area Agreement. And this year we launched it with 22 um, ratification out of 55. And as at last week when I was in uh, Kigali, we have got 28 ratifications. So we have already got more than 50% of the African countries ratifying, and it's only one country left to sign, and that is Eritrea. Um, so I, I don't think we have to worry in our own part, because we have no substitute, really, no substitute for, uh, um, and I will come to that, for working together, if not political integration, economic integration. We just have no alternative. And then that brings me to um, the point made about what can 
those in diaspora do. The point you have made, you, you get this discouragement, you get obstacles, you get hurdles. Um, and what I always say, and we get it, even those of us there, not the, the only those of you in, in diaspora, though even those of us there. And what I always say is that when uh, you meet with resistance, you continue to persist until you succeed. And you will always meet with resistance. When you meet with resistance, you continue to persist and look for a way out, and you will make it. And if there's any area you think I can help, um, you, you, you come in. And uh, uh, if, even when it is government, I believe we can wait government out. And I have done that. You can say, okay, look, the life of a government is four years. Let's see what, uh, if you can't, and then, of course, you also look for officials. The officials don't, they, 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 some of them understand. And um, if those that are holding portfolio are not helpful, there may be officials who can help. Um, but <clears throat> choose where you we work and look for those who can help you. Voting. I try to get this. And what they have always told me is that you need a constitutional amendment to allow Nigerians in diaspora to vote. Um, but I don't know. They, they have always said this. But even if we need the constitutional amendment, let us have it. Let us have it. There's no reason why Nigerians, bona fide Nigerians, cannot vote in their own country at any time that there are um, elections. Now let me come to the last uh, point, regional integration, particularly ECOWAS. Um, we have tried this, and of all the regional, uh, what they call regional economic um, Communi uh, communities, uh, community, mm -hmm. the regional economic community, REC, uh, ECOWAS is supposed to be the most advanced. But even that, to me, it has not advanced enough. But let me tell you, the, I, I will admit that we made a mistake even when I was in government. Because we left it to the experts who came to us and said that we need to have four areas of convergence for all the 14 states or 14 countries. And any time we met, Nigeria will meet three of the convergence uh, items. Uh, Ghana will meet two. Um, Cote d'Ivoire will meet two. And then we go away. Next year, Nigeria will meet not three, now two. Ghana will meet uh, three. And we were never able to move forward. I believe what we should have done will have been get what, what I try to do later um, and get zone of common prosperity and then agree three, four, and move on. Uh, but I believe that we still need to because even the continental free trade area agreement still depends on using the REC, the regional economic communities as the building block for the continental uh, integration. And um, we, we still have to do that. We don't have any alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congressman Frank? I don't think our government is doing very much at all, yet we're giving $400 million of foreign aid, but I don't think we're doing very, very much, much at all. When I watch the Chibok girl situation, when all the world leaders uh, world leaders from all over there. I mean, Cameron, hashtag bring back our girls. Nothing is being, nothing is really being done. Thirdly, the media is not covering this. The media today, keep in mind, Boko Haram has killed more people 
than ISIS killed in Iraq and Syria. Front page of every news story, Syria, Iraq, etc., ISIS, uh, there are no stories, no stories about Nigeria. Almost nothing in the Washington Post. Periodically, the New York Times will cover it, but the Western media really isn't, isn't really doing, doing any, anything. You compare this with Sudan. Uh, I went to Sudan many times. And members of Congress would go. It was a constant members. Of, I don't know the name of a congressman other than Congressman Chris Smith that's been to Nigeria. And when they fly into Nigeria, it's three hours in Abuja and get back on the plane and leave. And then they say they've been to Nigeria. You haven't been to America if you've just gone to New York City and stay there for three hours and leave or come to Washington. In Sudan, if you can recall, back in the 90s, many of the religious leaders in the United States, Chuck Colson, many, there were church services. I used to go to National Presbyterian Church and they would have Sudanese people to come in and talk about it. You remember the Lost Boys? You remember what was going on? The, the, uh, the coverage... Uh, it's totally different. So I think our government, for a lot of reasons, one government is inspired by what they read and who's contacting them. Is the diaspora calling? The, you have a large diaspora in Texas. Are they calling Senator Cruz's office every day? Are they going in to see Senator Cornyn, a great guy? Are they going in to see uh, Ben Cardin, a good friend in, in, in Maryland? Are, are they going in to see Senator Perdue down in Georgia? And so... If the media isn't covering, the Washington Post never covers the story, the New York Times barely covers it, the Wall Street Journal doesn't cover it, it just isn't really happening. And so therefore, no members of Congress go, very few press go. So how's our government doing? Not very, very well. The religious leaders for Sudan were always speaking out. Always. The religious leaders in America for Nigeria are quiet. And so I think that we are not doing, the American government is not doing a very good job because the media and nobody covers it. Every time I go out and give a speech, when I say the one thing, more people were killed in Nigeria by Boko Haram than was killed by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. People almost can't, can't believe it. If that being the case, so our government's failing. Thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, both of your responses. We do have to get to the bottom of the issue. So here's what I'm going to do. And I need everybody to work with me on this. So the president and Congressman Wolf have to leave at exactly 12 o'clock. So I see six hands up. I'm going to take those six hands, but you have exactly 30 seconds. <laughs> and I do have a um, cutoff thingy down here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll go Priya, the lady over here, the gentleman over here, and our two people over here. Let's see how we do on those, and then I, I see both of you, but let me see how we do on those six, and then I'll, I'll come around. So 30 seconds, please, and then I'll let uh, both of our speakers answer the questions that they can, and then we'll bring this to a close. So let's go. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Akwebo. I am a technical product manager at a software development company here. In, the, in, the, in DC. Please speak up so that I can hear you. I'm getting old. <laughs> I said, my name is, my name is Priye Aquibo. I'm a technical product manager at a software development company in DC. I have a question regarding you saying earlier, about looking inward. Many younger Nigerians attribute previous generations of entrenching the corruption and lack of responsi responsive or accountable government often seen as the norm today. How can Nigerian leaders bridge the divide between youthful population to equip the, young, the younger generation to lead and improve the nation. All right. So that's a question about the responsibility of previous uh, administrations in terms of entrenching some of the bad governance and how do you bridge the gap between the older generation and the youth, which speaks directly to your youth bulge question. Uh, lady over here. My name is Uluwa Tobi Oshobu Kolabubu. Um, I'm a PhD student at Howard University. Um, the question I have for Mr. President um, is, for President Obasanjo, excuse me, is um, what would it take for Nigeria 
to be more proactive. To be? To be more proactive mm. in nipping um, the establishment or the formation and growth of terrorist groups in the board. Um, I'm talking, okay. taking into example the case of Boko Haram and also um, your comments on the establishment of um, groups like AA Confraternity in Italy that also are involved in trafficking of um, victims. Right, can you pass it up to the lady just in front of you there? Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would just crave the indulgence of my Nigerian brothers here. I'm actually from Cameroon, uh, uh, Anglophone Cameroon. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, quick question. What are you doing as an elder statesman uh, for, our, for our continent? What are you doing about the Anglophone <laughs> crisis in Cameroon? <laughs> it is turning into another uh, Rwanda. Okay, and please, what am, I need am I, your what help. What am I doing for Cameroon? <laughs> what have, are you doing for our brothers in, in southern Cameroon with their ongoing okay, Anglophone okay. crisis? I, I will answer that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take uh, the gentleman uh, up here, right, right in front here. Let's move it along. No, it's coming to you. There's one behind you, uh, the gentleman behind you. That's okay. I'm coming to you. Let's keep it moving. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Wanchava. I'm a retired member of the, of the diplomatic service. I worked on Nigeria and Washington. I was at the American Embassy in Nigeria as well. Sir, if I may make a, a brief comparison between Nigeria and Brazil. The country of Brazil for many years was the butt of jokes, saying Brazil is the country of the future and it always will be. And I'm wondering if you feel that, that Nigeria, with its great resources, its great population, its great educational resources, will be able to reach its potential like, like Brazil has, which is now exporting airplanes to the world. What do you see as the future of Nigeria? Still to be confused with all these problems of diversity or a unified country that lives up to its potential? All right, so the comparison between Nigeria and Brazil, what are the potential lessons learned from that? Um, there was a gentleman right here in the, right there. Yes, please. Hi, my name is David Kuiper. I'm a, f a retired Foreign Service officer. I served in Nigeria for three years. Um, and I, uh, uh, Boko Haram started out basically as a homegrown um, operation in in, uh, out of my degree out of Borno, uh, and it uh, didn't seem to uh, pose much of a challenge to the country for some time, and now it's grown legs, it's uh, being able to sustain itself. Can you give us your um, uh, estimate of why this is the case, why they seem to be able to, to grow these legs and hold on? Thank you. All right, why Boko Haram has grown in strength and not been diminished, uh, even with its homegrown roots. I'll take, I have two more, I have two more 30 second slots and then I'll turn it over to uh, the, the, the president. I'll take the gentleman over here. Is Temi in here? All right, then I'll take Temi right there. Thank you. Mr. President, I'm Chief Onka Okwa. From the summary, the summary of what you've said, the problem is that of leadership. First of all, let me say this. I've, I've practiced politics in Nigeria. I've been a party, I've formed a political party, it was never in your own, but we all admit and agree that you were the most prepared president that ever emerged in that country. <laughs> that is a fact because you can discuss virtually every critical issue that involves governance. Now, what is your suggestion? Or what do you, how do you think we can solve the problem of the emergence of leadership in Nigeria? Because the problem is the way the leadership is thrown up. All right, so that's a question about the perceived leadership deficit in Nigeria. Stick the lady over here. Um, I'm Tammy Iberba with the Center for International Policy. Thank you for being here, Emerging, Mr. Sorry. President. Um, my question pertains to the arrest of the founder of Sahara Reporters and a candidate in the 2019 presidential election, Omoyele Soroy. 
Um, you're an influential voice in the African and international community, um, and you have spoken about democracy and democratic freedom, as well as good governance. So do you think it's important that you denounce the arrest of Shorore? All right. Before you respond, Mr. President, let me just correct myself over here. My, I, I don't want to get anyone into trouble. Uh, the question was the, the deficit in the emerging uh, leadership, not the current uh, leadership. I think that's a totally different question. So I want to reframe the question yeah. uh, correctly. Well, look, I, I, I will try and uh, touch <coughs> as much of uh, the questions that have been asked. Leadership, yes. I believe very strongly that the problem of most countries in Africa is problem of leadership. And where the leadership is by and large right, you can see the difference. Um, and how do we come out? What do we do? I, I said this last night. You see, we, we haven't established, and I believe that that's part of what we will have to do, establish the process of leaders coming out. Uh, I said here, um, until probably two or three presidents back, all the presidents in this country since the end of the Second World War have had some form of military background. It's all part of making leaders. In Britain, they will tell you that their leaders emerge from public school, that is private schools. Um, we, I believe in our own case, we, 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 we haven't figured out what it will be. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the French, you have to go to the French administrative school. Uh, it's one of the things that you have to do to emerge as a leader. I believe we have to find a way out. We aren't there yet, uh, but it's one of the things that we have to do. What should be our uh, motivation? Uh, as I said, we have to have certain things that we agree on. What is our dream, national dream? What is our national objective? What is our national uh, 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 vision and, and mission? All that. But I think we will do that. Now, um, oh. We are reminded that you have to be uh -huh. at 12. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, Brazil, I, I think we, you know, this is the longest uh, democratic dispensation we have had in Nigeria. Uh, 59 years, uh, we had democracy from 1960 to 1966, then it crashed. Uh, we had another one that lasted, I think, uh, was it four years, four, four years, three months, it crashed. This has lasted 20 years, mm -hmm. and um, I hope it will continue, uh, touch wood. Um, so, <laughs> so I think we are, to that extent, making progress. Now, whether we will uh, put this thing behind us, the fact that we are talking about them what is wrong and what we need to do, I think is good. We should continue to talk about them. Um, and some of us must be ready to make, to pay the price. I went to prison for almost three and a half years because I told Labacha to stop being in government as a military man. If you want to be uh, in government, put down your uniform and contest the election. Now, I opened my mouth too wide and I was putting <laughs> I was put in jail, but I, I, was, I was better for it. And I believe Nigeria was better for it. I, I think we will get there. And um, uh, Cameroon, what did we do? The, the um, Archbishop of Canterbury and I, we were about the, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio, uh, has got a team of 18 of us. He called us body of mediators. And um, I had wanted to see President Bia, and I sent a message to him. And when the message was delivered, he said, look, what did I want to come for? And he was told I wanted to come for intervening between. What worried me is not even what you were worried about, but children 
in Western Cameroon have not gone to school for three years. For three years. And that, I believe, something should be done. Then he asked us to come, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and I. And the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury has sent his uh, uh, advance party. I had moved to Abuja, and I was about to take off from Abuja and go to Cameroon. I got a message that it should be aborted because the president was ill. And um, they said it would be bad if we went and we couldn't see him. Well, since then, he seemed to have organized some form of uh, um, conference. Uh, he hasn't called us back, but uh, I hope one day he will call us back. So we are doing something about your country. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let me say this. The issue of Boko Haram, um, it is an internally generated issue. And when I went to my, uh, my degree in 2011, I asked, how much is Boko Haram uh, externalized? And the man who was talking to me, who was the middleman between me and Boko Haram leadership, who were out of the country, said maybe 10, 15 percent. And I said, how do you know? He said, yes, he knew the leaders. They are not men of any means that they are bringing in some new weapons. And so somebody must be paying for those weapons, either Nigerians who have resources or some external uh, resources. Now, then, three years ago, I asked the same man, how much is Boko Haram externalized? He said, at least 50%. At least 50%. OK. Now, if that is the case, we are in danger. With ISIS being driven from Syria and uh, Iraq, they have nowhere to go but Africa, particularly North Africa. And one area, one country that they will want to go is Libya. Libya is almost a failed state, and Libya has resources. And if you have ISIS staying, taking over Libya, we will all be in trouble. And not only us, a lot will happen in Europe and maybe here as well. So it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that that does not happen. And um, uh, I, I believe it, it is the work, and that is why the work, uh, people like uh, Congressman Wolf, um, the work they are doing is very, very important important for our own country, but we have to find solution because part of our problem is because of lack of education. 53% literacy in the Northeast, 94% in the South. Now, you can see that gap. That gap itself speaks for itself that, look, you cannot have unity without you closing the gap between the education in, of uh, the, the people in the north and education of people in the south. You cannot, and education has implication for employment, um, employability, for standard of living, for everything. And that we have to do. We have 14 million children that should be in school that are not in school. It doesn't matter what we do with Boko Haram today. Those 14 million are Boko Haram of 10, 15 years from now, unless we do something about it. Thank you. Congressman Wolf, would you like to close us off no, in one no, minute? Fine. All right, we, okay, so you can see that we can continue this uh, discussion with uh, the president. There are a lot of issues that have been um, raised here. Uh, so, Baba, this uh, is an open invitation for you to come back and continue this discussion. We didn't even uh, get uh, the half of it. Man, man there. I'll, right. be more than ready. I'll be more than ready. Uh, uh, all right. So we really uh, appreciate But uh, you, you, you have to ask uh, Congressman Wolf to be by my side. We will. He <laughs> is a fantastic support. We certainly will. So please join me in thanking Congressman Wolf and President Obasanjo for this wonderful discussion. And 
I also want to thank all of you uh, for making it here. Nigeria is a really important country. The issues that impact Nigeria impact uh, not just this country, but Nigerians themselves, but also the rest of the continent. So thank you so much for coming and for engaging in this discussion. I know there are a couple of questions that were not answered. I will um, work with Atom to see if we can get those responses to the respective people who asked uh, those questions with the president. I know he's usually very forthcoming. If you have, if you have a, a, a question that is really, really um, uh, pressing, you, you want, put it in writing yes. and give it to my assistant or any member of the uh, Niger uh, International Committee on Nigeria, and I will answer and send to you. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing that. So as we conclude this event, what I'd like to do is just to invite the President and Congressman Wolf to join us here and the leadership of ICANN and the rest of the delegation to just join us for a photo. For the rest of you, we hope to see you at the Wilson Center. We have two more events this week, one looking at China in Africa, relations at the non-state level, uh, what the Chinese migration and how that's impact relations between citizen to citizen in Africa. We have another um, event on um, Peace building in the Central African Republic, looking at the role of agriculture in building peace uh, in that country. And then on November 6th, we have a huge uh, event here that we hope you join us for, which is looking at U.S.-Africa economic engagement at the state level and the role that the African diaspora is playing in that and how state level and federal level mechanisms are articulating to enhance economic engagement between the United States and Africa. So we hope to see you at some of these events. Thank you again for coming. And for those of you joining us online, thank you. Yeah, no, let's go.